What's your view on wrist locks? Since you mentioned leg locks and I ignore, but largely front, uh, do you think they have a place in jiu-jitsu? Yeah, uh, that, that's an excellent question. These are good questions these kids are answering, uh, asking. Um, okay, let, let's put out a, a, a general statement here on submissions. P people are very quick to make distinctions between different kinds of locks, okay? You know, leg locks, arm locks, um, uh, wrist locks. Uh, the lock you select is really based around how much control do you have prior to the lock, okay? The lock is just the, the full stop at the end of a sentence. It's the sentence that counts, and that sentence is control. When I first started with leg locks, the great problem that I saw with leg locking in the 1990s, for example, is that there was no control. They were just moves where you jumped into it and hoped for the best. Okay, you, you tried to apply it as quickly as possible uh, before the other guy could react, and, uh, uh, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. It was more or less a kind of a desperation move. Um, as a result, the lack of control meant many injuries and a lot of failures. Um, my whole thing was to change the nature of leg locking into a control-based game, to really make a deep study of, of the whole idea of ashigarami or entangled legs so that you could control people for long periods of time the same way you do from the mounted position when you're working for an armbar, the same way you do from guard position when you're working for a triangle. Um, I never say to someone, this kind of joint lock is ineffective. My question is never that. It's not, is the lock effective? My question is always, how effective is the control prior to the lock? Okay, that's the question you need to ask. With regards to leg locks, historically, the control was minimal. That's changed now. If you look at leg lockers now, there's a lot of control that you can put over your opponent through the use of various kinds of ashigarami. Um, if you look at most upper body joint locks, there's a lot of control. They come out of very controlling positions, like variations of guard, uh, mount position, side position. These are very controlling positions. Um, the problem I have with most forms of wrist lock is that there's very little prior control to the application of the move. So at least currently, um, they tend in the majority of cases to be moves where they can have a useful effect uh, to get people to move in certain kinds of way. They can have a good distraction effect, but they're not a systematic, they, there's no systematic set of controls that lead to their application. There is one interesting uh, uh, counterexample to this. I do believe wrist locks can be highly effective when they are uh, used in the context of a triangle attack. When you have someone's head and arm tied up in a triangle, but the strangle is proving to be very difficult to finish. And for whatever reason, you can't switch to an arm lock on the elbow. Wrist locks can be very effective there because the triangle gives you a lot of control over your opponent's movement. And so wrist locks out of triangles can be very effective because you have initial control. But wrist locks just performed in the open without some kind of prior control, uh, much more dubious. So I do believe there is a context in which wrist locks can be an important part of your game. But again, it's not about the lock, it's about the control you have prior to the lock. If you can show me prior control to a wrist lock, I'm gonna be impressed. And I believe that the best form of prior control to a wrist lock, which we currently have, is through the use of triangles. And wrist locks out of triangles can be a useful way to, uh, to, to use that form of submission with excellent control prior to the application of a lock. 